So first of all, I'd just like to say thank you very much to uh, Margaret and also John and, and everybody who spent time with me over the last few days and having chats and things. It's been really, really good. And thank you very much for having me. Um, it was a, a, a nice congruence of events, basically. So it's great. Um, and what I'd like to do is spend a little bit of time today talking about novel ecosystems. Um, I'm wondering how many of you have heard of the term. I know Margaret has, because we were discussing it on Thursday. So I'll spend a little bit of time uh, discussing what they are uh, and why I think that they're important across the terrestrial and also marine sphere, and then what we can do about managing them. Uh, and that's from a kind of restoration ecology background, as Margaret pointed out. Uh, before I start properly, I just wanted to uh, point out my conspirators or collaborators in this. Um, uh, some of you may know Richard, he's actually in, in charge of our research group. Um, and together with Chris, Rachel and Laurie, who are uh, postdocs with me as well, um, we basically have been discussing this over the last few years. Um, and some of what I'm going to present to you has arisen out of a, a workshop that we did in Canada a couple of years ago um, that's now led to a book. Um, and I'm going to plug the book right at the very end so that you can, uh, it's actually coming out um, as of Friday, I think it's due out in March. So. Uh, and, but what I'm also going to tell you about is an experiment that we set up on restoring multiple ecosystem services, which may well be a, a goal that we want in restoration. Uh, and we couldn't have done that without the help of Tim and Beck, along with the four of us, and numerous other people. So uh, my thanks go to them. Um, these are some of the numerous other people who um, helped us set it up. I think to date now we've had about probably approaching 100 people now, I guess, involved in this in some way or another over the last two and a half years. So, get going. Um, I'm going to try and persuade you today why novel ecosystems are a necessary consideration for restoration ecology. And I'm going to talk about what I think are the classical ideas of restoration ecology and how maybe we can reframe those going into the future. Um, and basically show that the novel ecosystems are uh, across the globe and that with continued environmental change, we really need to consider them. And that rather than despairing um, about them, we can actually see them as potentially having conservation opportunities. Um, I'm going to talk about those. And then also going to talk about how ecological theory can inform practice. And that will lead on to the Ridgefield experiment. Um, and then finally, um, hopefully I won't go over time, I'm going to just talk a little bit about what I'm hoping to achieve from my work with uh, Earl and Sussink. And I'm really hoping I'll get some feedback on that. Hopefully it won't be, can you leave? <laughs> Um, so, um, and I'm kind of summarising that, that I'd like to try and improve global estimates of ecological impact. And whether that's actually possible or not is, is a, I think, something that's worth discussing and thinking about. <coughs> so novel ecosystems. Back in 2006, Richard had a, another um, meeting with a number of people. Uh, and they came up with a, 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 um, an idea about what's, what kind of use there is in, on the land, mainly. Um, and you can consider that there are areas with no uh, land use um, by humans directly, uh, and those would be uh, kind of a, a wild or a historical reference. And then you can go on a continuum to really intensively use land, agricultural land, plantations. Um, and in between those is where they said that you've got novel ecosystems. And they were basically saying that over the past you know, 100, 150 years, and, and also going much further back in time, um, systems have become either degraded through, uh, say, plant invasions or off-site influences like nitrogen deposition. And by de degraded, I mean they've changed their composition from whatever was there in the absence of human influence. Um, or you could have had intensively used land that's become abandoned. Um, and then that also is then kind of stuck in some kind of um, state where it's not going back to some kind of historical uh, composition. And they said that those are novel ecosystems. Now, if you um, think about that in terms of the current environmental changes and everything, you could basically say, oh, well, the whole world's novel. And so is that actually useful from a, a management perspective and actually helping people work out what to do with these systems? Um, so in 2009, they um, tried to differentiate novel from just uh, everything um, and basically came up with this uh, graph here and said you can consider abiotic change on the x-axis, or you can con consider biotic change from some kind of reference. And as you move further away, you're basically going through towards a novel system. 
um, and they came up with this hybrid system in between. And the important difference between hybrid and novel is essentially that there are thresholds that are preventing you from restoring the system. Now, those thresholds are, are highly context dependent, and um, you know, in, in terms of kind of as a biophysical scientist, it would be nice to think there's nice solid numbers there that what's a threshold and what isn't. Um, but actually, there's socioeconomic thresholds that come into this, and also resource thresholds and things. Um, and so those arrows are just basically giving an idea that potentially you can move back from a hybrid system to a reference system. Um, whereas if you're in a novel state, you actually can't get back. There are barriers preventing you from doing that. Um, and just to give a, not a flippant example, but clearly if you've got an extinction of a species, that's a threshold that can't really be overcome, uh, notwithstanding Jurassic Park and things. Um, <coughs> but you also have these, uh, as I say, abiotic thresholds. Um, that could be like uh, high phosphorus preventing return of species. Um, but they could be dealt with. But you also have socioeconomic, oh, sorry, socioeconomic thresholds. And here I'm actually looking. Um, you may know that you need to have a certain fire regime to get back to some kind of reference condition. But due to housing constraints or population, you can't put those fire regimes in. So that's clearly going to be a threshold to restoration. So that's kind of where it got to by 2009. In 2011, as I say, I was fortunate enough to take part in this workshop that Richard and Eric, who were, um, basically did this paper al along with Jim Harris, um, organized a workshop in Canada. And at that, after much debate, um, we tried to come up with a, an, a, basically a definition of a novel ecosystem as we think of it now. Um, there's actually a whole chapter on the kind of origins of the concepts and talking about how species um, move um, individualistically in response to change. This has been obviously going on over, and so ecosystems are dynamic. And so, really, it might be most useful to think of novelty on a continuum. But for, again, for this management kind of perspective, it, it's helpful to think about whether there are thresholds and these kind of discontinuities. Um, and so, there are kind of crucial characteristics essentially, um, and those are that the abiotic, biotic, and social components. Um, differ from something that would have existed there in the past, um, but also that they c can be maintained without continued human influence. So as I say, if you take those abandoned farm fields, they just are in some kind of state and it seems to be perpetuating and they can evolve um, without any further input from humanity. Um, and then this idea that they're distinguished from hybrid systems by practical limitations. And as I say, those can be you know, real ecological thresholds, or it could be more um, you know, social, economic kind of thresholds. And as a decision tree um, help in terms of you know, where are you, um, you can say, is the target system altered by um, because of humans? And then if you say yes, then you can consider, are these changes reversible or not? Um, and if they're reversible, then you're in the hybrid. And then with time and restoration, you can hopefully get back to a reference, if that's what you want. Um, or that hybrid could change to a novel if you actually don't do things. And I'll go on to discuss that. And then if you don't think the changes are reversible, then you've got a novel system. One thing I didn't say um, as well and things to think about are sometimes that the, the scale that you're working on as a manager, say in a, 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 um, you know, a plot or a site, there are changes that are happening out with that site, so like the nitrogen deposition or the climate change that you really can't actually deal with. Um, and so those kind of cross-scale um, problems are really tricky. And I was talking to Jonathan about wicked issues the other day, and th those kind of, that must be a wicked issue, I think. Um, so where are they in the world? If, how can we, you know, is it an important problem? Do we need to um, worry about them in terms of restoration or conservation? Um, traditionally, um, as a terrestrial ecologist, I would have looked at um, biomes, and then this would be your kind of potential um, vegetation of the, of the world, um, taken from Olsen. But that's actually not what we have. And so I work with Earl um, on this. And well, not this bit, but this is uh, something that Earl put out in Frontiers in 2007. Um, all right, sorry. Um, and this is basically saying what we actually have in the world. We obviously have a, a highly changed system due to human influence. Um, and I mean, the details in here don't really matter. But clearly, humanity is having a big impact on the patterns of vegetation in the world. And anthromes are basically worked out on um, population density and land use based on the suitability of the, 
uh, land area. Um, hopefully, um, no doubt when he'll comes down and gives a talk, he'll give a much better explanation of that, but that's um, essentially how they, they, they look at them to do this classification. What Earl and I did, um, f uh, we wanted to get an estimate of the spatial extent um, and, so, and of novel systems. And so what we said in, the, in those um, grid cells with land use, um, there are particular parts of that uh, grid cell that aren't used by humans um, directly. And so you could consider those to be novel systems. Um, and then in other areas, you have no evidence of direct human use, so there's, and there's no population there. So that's clearly the uh, kind of um, boreal regions here. Um, although um, that's so that there's you know, particular thresholds, again, associated with that, how many people per square kilometre and things. Um, and then finally, you have some areas like the Midwest here, um, where essentially it seems that the um, you know, amount of use is just total of the land, and so there's actually, it's all used within a particular grid cell. Now this clearly is something to do with the scale, again, that you do these kind of analyses. Um, and so this gives an idea of, of novelty in the, in the biosphere, um, but we're, we haven't considered biotic invasions in this. This is purely just a land use and population estimate way of getting at it. Um, there's no idea of thresholds, so whether there's actually, you know, stop, stopping you going back to a a system or not, and there's no idea of off-site influence here. Well, so, like, how are you calling a novel? Like, the key characteristic of a novel is that you have that threshold. So this was a this, and well, this is where the, the issue comes in. Is something that's very so it's novelty rather than I'm, I guess I'm using it in a um, interchangeably in this in that sense at the moment, and it's definitely something that needs thinking through. And despite having a whole book on it, it's not something that's um, you know being um, addressed fully, I don't think. There's the idea of the thresholds from the management side of things. If you're trying to do this at a terrestrial global level, um, trying to get at those thresholds at different areas is, is really, really tricky. And that's something that I'd like to discuss here, whether we can do that. So this was the first pass saying, if you, we can have an estimate of how land is used in the um, system. But we know that there's areas of that land that isn't used in a particular grid cell. So it's, but it's likely that that land is, is heavily influenced by humanity in some way. So did you, did, I forgot, what was the word you used if it's not reference wild and it's not novel? It, it's hybrid. Not, hybrid? Yeah. So does this not include hybrid? No, so it's just okay. basically saying this is, and that's, that scale is percent novelty essentially, rather than saying something's a hybrid or novel. We didn't feel that we could have the, um, resolution on the data to allow us to make those kind of um, inferences. What we were trying to get at is just is, you know, how much of the globe is actually in, in use and if you take out those areas but from an essentially used area, what's, you could consider that to be novel in some way. Um, the kind of take home message was that there was actually more novel area than wild area um, on, the, on the land surface. Um, what I also wanted to try and do, does that answer your question partially, Margaret? Or, yeah. So is this sort of like potential novel ecosystem? Yeah. You could, but it also is potent in the sense that those areas that are, you know, saying it's entirely used, there are clearly within those areas, there are patches that, you know, are still remnant vegetation. There is probably abandoned fields in those highly used landscapes. It's just that the spatial scale of the data, it's five arc minutes at the moment doesn't capture those kind of um, details. What I also wanted to do was try and estimate um, whether there's any, can you estimate novelty of marine systems? Um, and so I've, I've basically borrowed um, Ben Halpin's work from science a few years ago, um, where he, rather than looking at direct measures of land use and population in the, in the ocean, he um, basically tried to estimate the e ecological impact um, that's happened on across oceans. Uh, and so he looks at 17 drivers of change on ecosystems, and then he looks at um, up to 20 ecosystem types, six of which he modelled, 14 of which were actual maps. And together with experts, they basically try to say, um, if you've got this driver of change, this is how susceptible the ecosystem is, this particular ecosystem is to that driver. Um, and so they did that over all drivers and over all different ecosystem types. And they, again, had a kind of equal area grid in the oceans um, or 
lap long grid um, and uh, essentially tried to get, um, get this measure of impacts. Um, and I mean, you can, eat, I don't know whether you can quite see it, but you can actually see shipping lanes and things going across the Pacific here and um, that kind of resolution. Um, what you do see is that there's areas with, that are highly changed due to either the multitude of drivers or the number of ecosystem types. And that's why coastal areas are particularly um, highlighted here because they're the, <coughs> they're the areas that have got the most number of ecosystem types in a given cell and they've also got the most number of drivers and stresses of, of change. Um, and again, using a, um, uh, again, these aren't saying this is hybrid or novel or, or reference, but in the sense of having um, more change might be more indicative of greater novelty, then you could consider that these areas are, are more novel than the middle of the Pacific or those kind of um, ideas. Um, and then finally, um, the other reason why I think that we have to consider uh, novelty and novel systems are the environmental changes that are, are, are going on in the in the globe at the moment um, and uh, you know we all know these exponential um, change that are going on and it can be quite depressing when depending on who's presenting them and when as to whether we're all going to be around or not so um, I won't dwell on those anymore but we all know that that's going on um, so that's why I'd argue that um, we need to consider them in restoration and that the um, there are thresholds to restoration. Some of them may be resource, but some of them may be more uh, fundamental than that. Um, and so does that mean that we need to have some kind of reframing of restoration ecology? And I know Margaret's familiar with this little bit. Um, so um, <coughs> if you go to the primer on ecological restoration, it talks about it being the process of uh, assisting the recovery of an ecosystem that's been degraded, damaged, <coughs> or destroyed. The, uh, it then goes on to discuss nine attributes of um, uh, uh, ecosystems, restored ecosystems. Most of those attributes, they don't ignore environmental change, um, but most of the attributes concentrate on kind of the composition of the system uh, as well as the function of the system. But the, the kind of the take home from it, at least in, in some my reading, is that the um, composition is what's Im important and then function will follow from that. Um, and whether that's going to remain the and the historical composition, whether that remains the case given all of these environmental changes is something that needs to be thought about. And so um, that's where we ended up thinking about how can you, what can your goals be for restoration ecology if given the presence of novelty? Um, and so Lauren Hallett um, basically came up with an idea of thinking about what the um, function in systems can be. And if you consider, again, going back to this kind of reference hybrid novel uh, scheme, um, a reference system is likely to have, is clearly going to have similar biotic and abiotic composition. So we've, we've essentially um, put the two orthogonal axes from 2009 just onto one here, saying what's the overall change. And then on the y axis, we're saying how much, what's the functionality of your system. If you've got a reference system, then you'd expect the function to be similar as well as clearly the composition will be similar. Um, as you move to more dissimilar compositions, it's likely that your function is going to become more and more dissimilar. Um, and so hence why there's this not possible part here as well, where you've got a similar composition, you're not expecting similar fun uh, dissimilar function. And then in terms of um, thinking about management, um, then you can consider um, these areas here and say, OK, well, I've got a hybrid system that's functioning in a similar manner to the past, and that's what my goal was, um, even though its composition is different. And so you can either try and move it back so that its uh, biotic and abiotic composition is similar, or you can try and maintain it in that state um, so that it doesn't go over the threshold into novel. Um, or you could have a system up here um, where the function is dissimilar and you want to get it back to similar functioning. So you have to try and work out ways of doing that. Um, just as, a, as an example of maintaining kind of in the similar state and thinking about what you do, um, this is the Californian Bay checker spot butterfly, San Francisco Bay, sorry. Um, and uh, that was uh, getting increasingly threatened from nitrogen deposition that was changing the uh, community composition of the serpentine grassland that it was found in. Um, 
and it was basically affecting the food plants and the and then you know the nurse plant for the caterpillars and things. Um, what they actually found, and as I was mentioning about these cross-scale problems, um, you can't really deal with the nitrogen deposition problem uh, on your patch. Um, what they found was actually if they introduced cattle grazing, um, the cattle were preferentially grazing on the grasses that were being benefited by the nitrogen deposition, and that was then maintaining the uh, food plants of the, of the butterfly. So you can basically think about potentially novel ways of managing systems to maintain your desired goal. So that, that was kind of an example there. Then you've got the kind of what you can consider are the novel systems, and how do you actually go about getting back to some kind of function that you want from those dissimilar systems, given that you can't overcome certain thresholds. And oops. Um, so what uh, Chris came up with in, in a, um, was that you could consider three different ways of, of um, uh, kind of reframing restoration in terms of this maintaining functionality. Uh, and I'm just going to briefly go on and talk about the protecting the species and also managing for novel species composition or function. And then the main part is going to be con concentrating on this and presenting the Ridgefield experiment that we've set up. So if you think about protecting species and biodiversity, um, and again, this is, these are kind of just case study examples. Um, this is a, a Rodriguez Fodi, um, and that after agricultural change um, on Rodriguez Island, it almost went extinct. I think they measured there were about five or six pairs they thought left in the wild. Um, it's actually now recovered, but it's only recovered due to the presence of, oh, due to the presence of a non-native uh, Queensland pine. Um, and in the absence of that Queensland pine, it's highly likely that it would have actually gone extinct. Um, and so that then gets you thinking about, well, do we just always try and get rid of non-native species or not? As that's kind of the general gist of what people usually used to think, um, if it means that other species go extinct. Um, and there are other examples of, of that kind of interaction. Um, then you can also think about um, using spaces uh, to try and boost composition. This isn't necessarily a novel composition here. This is a, um, a limestone grassland in, um, or chalk grassland in the UK. Um, and they're under increasing threat. Um, what you could end up doing is actually using um, construction rubble to artificially create limestone grasslands. And that's going on in Newcastle at the moment in the UK. Um, and then they're examining what that means for people's appreciation of, of nature and things. Um, I think that raises all sorts of interesting questions because Newcastle's beyond the where you'd normally get limestone in the UK, um, but it also is trying to take into account climate change and things like that. So whether we should be doing those kind of interventions or not, but that's just a, an idea. Um, there's another one of a similar kind which is very close to home here. This is um, thanks to Keith Bowers. I don't know whether any of you know him, but he's. Um, basically does quite a lot of wetland restoration, amongst other things. Um, this is actually from Baltimore Harbour, and they um, recover the plastic bottles in the harbour. You can probably correct me if I'm getting any of this wrong, but this is what I've been told. Um, and make these floating wetlands um, that then try and restore uh, the habitat in that area. And Keith sent me a, um, this, which was a, I think this is actually a computer generated image of what it's meant to look like. Um, I was actually down in the harbour on Saturday, and so I got to see what it looks like in the middle of February. And um, so that's, um, what those look like at the moment. That actually had multiple benefits. He was saying that the, um, uh, it involved the local community in the making of those, and so then they took far greater ownership of the harbour and that area. Um, and so it's not just a benefit for the conservation of the wetland or restoring of the habitat There's, and water quality. There are other social benefits to that. So um, going on to recovering and maintaining ecosystem functions, um, this is where I wanted to introduce a bit of ecological theory um, and also experimental results. Um, this is a kind of classic uh, how biodiversity influences um, productivity or e influences ecosystem function. And classically, people have looked at different species numbers and then looked at what that means for biomass or single ecosystem functions. Uh, and this kind of saturating relationship is what you tend to find. So these are all, you know, the one species, there are lots of different monocultures of constituent species going up to species mixtures. Um, however, the, although that's the kind of average relationship, um, composition really matters. Um, so here we've got an experiment that, um, again, is quite a classic one looking in uh, grasslands. 
and you've either got early season annuals, late season annuals, perennials, which are the P, or you've got nitrogen fixers. And, if you, and basically in these different functional groups on the x-axis. And if you made up a, um, basically if you, if you started with perennials and then added other functional groups to that mixture, you'd actually decrease the productivity of, that, of those mixtures. Whereas if you had early season annuals and added other species to them, then you'd increase and get the typical saturating curve. But the lesson from there is that you need to think about the composition of what's going into your system. I'm not going to show these results, but there's been more work recently about how if you're looking for multiple functions, then you need more species to maintain those multiple functions. It's likely that if you're trying to get a system that functions through time, you need more species for that to happen as well. So those kind of results indicate that it's important to think about composition as well as species number in if you're trying to re recover an ecosystem. So we, um, the thing with those experiments is that most of them have got been done in grasslands. Um, quite a lot of restoration is done in woodlands or, or forested land. And that's the uh, question we had with our experiment over in Western Australia, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, and so what we did was we tried to um, have a look, uh, and this is uh, Chris, um, tried to have a look basically ac um, across the number of experiments we could find that actually looked at woody ecosystem function um, against species richness. Um, and I think she found, managed to find the grand total of about seven or eight experiments, basically, that we could use the data from. And so she did a, a, a meta-analysis um, uh, where she considered all of these and looked at, compared essentially the species mixtures against what happened in monoculture. And so this first graph basically just shows, uh, on the total side, um, you know, all of the experiments that we could get hold of, how um, the mixtures compared to the average monoculture from those um, st uh, studies. Um, again, these are the Woody studies, as I say. And then that just splits it into the different categories that we actually had. Um, the weighted, unweighted just refers to whether we had actually variance measurements from the data in the original papers. Um, and so weighted takes into account that if you don't actually have variance, then you have to do an unweighted analysis, which is less um, certain, basically. The take home from this is that essentially species mixtures didn't seem to harm um, the amount of, this is uh, carbon in terms of, sorry I didn't say that, in terms of the function, um, this is amount of biomass basically, and that species mi mixtures didn't actually uh, harm that uh, and, and seemed to increase it. Um, what would be particularly interesting though in terms of this composition question is how does the uh, best performing monoculture compare to the mixtures? And we're thinking particularly here in terms of if you've got incentives to plant trees for carbon and you're going to get monetary incentives to do that, um, it's likely that you'll go for the fastest growing tree or the best mixture that will, um, you know, as well as thinking about planting costs and things. Um, so what we also wanted to do was look at how the best performing monoculture compared to the mixtures. Did you adjust for uh, abundance? Yeah, so this is why there were so few um, actual studies that we could use because it had to be equal density plantings um, and um, on the same substrate. Because that really confounds them. Yeah, yeah. So uh, glad you've asked that. <laughs> um, so we, as I say, we looked at the best performing monoculture. Um, and again, although it's not um, as good, there was no harm in mixtures, essentially. And there's potentially other benefits to having mixtures. Um, uh, as opposed to um, what was found in monocultures. Um, this isn't entirely driven by nitrogen fixers, um, but uh, a lot of the results are driven by the fact that there are nitrogen fixers in the mixtures. Um, but it's not entirely driven by that. So that's what we found from our um, literature, or Chris found um, from her um, literature review and, and analysis. Um, what we, uh, in the same time of doing that, we would realised that there was a lack of experimentation, and particularly in the sense of from a restoration context. Um, and so that's where we came up with our um, experiments in Western Australia. So as a little um, travel, we're obviously over here at the moment, and I'm going to take you all the way over there, hopefully. Um, and this is Western Australia. Uh, for those of you who've not been there, um, Perth is just here, which is where the university is. Um, and you can see the nice patch of water there. That's where I do my sailing on the, uh, on the weekend. Um, and. Uh, Essentially, this straight line here is actually a, a, a natural boundary. There's a, a ridge of hills that uh, just outside of Perth. 
and that's where Alcoa do their bulk site mining and um, various other um, ref, uh, other activities. Um, and this is in the Jarra Forest. That's where the bulk site mining goes on. If you're familiar with that. Uh, and this Swan Coastal Plain um, has uh, kind of heathland vegetation um, and banksia and things like that. Um, and then as you go out from, from the Jarrah Forest, you hit the, this area here. Now this used to be wooded um, and it's now been entirely cleared essentially for agriculture. So this is the wheat belt of Western Australia. And then that uh, grades into the Great Western Woodlands, which is the largest expanse of temperate woodland um, in the world, I believe, um, still intact although there's a lot of mining leases on it at the moment. Um, so in terms of uh, the wheat belt, um, it used to be wooded with, uh, a lot of it was wooded with a species called York gum. Um, and, uh, oh sorry, that's um, Person Ridgefield is where the experiment is. Um, I'll just say, about Ridgefield is uh, actually owned by the university. Uh, it's called the Future Farm 2050. Um, and the idea is to uh, look at ways to make farming sustainable and profitable uh, going into the future while and so there's experiments out there looking at um, putting sheep on the land that re um, release less methane um, that with forage crops that uh, that are native that are perennial rather than annual grasslands that uh, all die off um, and then a, a part of that um, the idea behind Ridgefield is actually to uh, restore biodiversity into the landscape um, restore connectivity between the remnant patches that are still in existence and that's where we came in with our work. Um, and so this is essentially what the wheat belt looks like. It's full of either wheat or oilseed rape or canola uh, and a few sheep um, and then you get these few patches of, of remnant woodland. Now um, this remnant woodland, a lot of it's uh, York gum. There's also acacia species um, and then you have an understory of um, of herbs and grasses essentially. Um, these are the everlastings, the pink plant flowers that you can see there. Um, it's unlikely, a lot of those kind of herb, herbaceous species we don't really know how to um, get back into the system. And we also um, essentially, uh, as I say, with this driver potentially for restoration coming from monetary incentives for carbon and things, there'll be people wanting to plant trees for carbon and we were interested in how does the composition of those mixtures influence that and also other ecosystem functions? Um, so we basically decided to use the system that, um, you know, if you had abandoned agricultural land, it wasn't going to go back without us planting trees and then looked at putting these different mixtures in to see what would happen to function. So this went in in August 2010. Um, and so we were interested in carbon, as I've already said, nutrient cycling and reducing loss rates from the different mixtures of uh, so to prevent eutrophication. Um, looking at the resistance to non-native species in the system, depending on what we planted. Um, also looking at soil erosion control and then the maintenance of biodiversity in the area as well. And we were interested in not only the response of all of those to the composition, but also how they um, all interact and also whether there are trade-offs or synergies among them and how those trade-offs depend on the uh, traits of the species that we plant. So we basically came up with a design. We couldn't do a classic biodiversity ecosystem function experiment, so we said, what's the tree that would most likely be planted by a farmer who was wanting to get quick growth and quick returns, and that would be a York gum. So we had an unplanted plot, and then we put York gum in plots at 110 trees per plot. And then we basically swapped out some of those York gum individuals with replacing them with individuals of other species with particular strategies uh, of nutrient acquisition because that's what we uh, believed had most influence on those kind of uh, functions essentially. And so the AM and ECM inferred here refers to arbuscular mycorrhizal and ectomycorrhizal species. Um, one of the things when you go over to Perth is how little we actually know about the flora um, over there because uh, it's so hyper-diverse, so there's quite a lot of inferences depending on the genus that you're looking at and the, as to what is actually happening. We just don't know in some cases. Um, then we decided we'd add, replace some of the trees. Um, so we, sorry, we replaced the York gums with another tree species um, so that we had, had a mixture of two. Uh, and then we replaced some of more of the York gums with either acacia species, um, metaceous shrub species, uh, which, if you've ever seen bottle brushes in Australia or elsewhere, that's what they are. Um, and we also put some proteaceous species 
Um, and these are interesting because they've got, obviously, the acacias there, nitrogen fixing. Um, the metaceous shrubs are the, essentially the same family as the trees and, uh, sorry, not family, but, um, but anyway, they're, they're um, arbuscular mycorrhizal and exomycorrhizal. Um, and then the proteaceous species, they form these cluster roots that enables them to access uh, phosphorus through releasing carboxylates. Um, so now the interesting thing is that's, that's a really useful adaptation in Western Australia on the Kwangan shrublands and places like that because phosphorus is in, you know, in incredibly low supply. Um, on former agricultural land that's had phosphorus chucked at it for 60 or 80 years, it's not in low supply. So how... Nitrogen uh, in in the you know the native systems it's incredibly low yeah yeah there um, so that's yeah that's what's happening there so that's um, the start and then we carried on this design and basically mixed up one of the acacia species with one of the uh, sh shrub other shrub species or the proats or the merts and then we put all of them together um, and so what was what we like to think is neat about this experiment is essentially that we've got six treatments where we've got the species richness is the same at four, but we've got different functional groups representing, making up that species richness, and also with different numbers of functional groups, depending on um, which individuals we have. And then, as I say, you can't entirely disentangle species richness from functional richness. So we've got an overall gradient of species richness increasing from zero to eight. And we, we anticipate that when they um, grow up um, to adulthood or whatever, there'll be different structural complexity as well in this, in this system. So that's kind of what it looks like on the table. This is actually what it looks like um, in the field. Um, so because we had a, um, you know, a, sl a slope in, you know, a couple of paddocks basically, um, we had to try and get the plots around rocks and trees and goodness knows what else. So it's very real, <laughs> real world um, in that sense. Um, we therefore wanted to replicate as far as we could. Um, so we had a formally grazed land use where we managed to put ten reps of the ten treatments. Um, what we also had was an area that had previously been cropped, um, but that's quite a small area. So we just did the, ex, uh, the um, extremes of the uh, diversity gradient there of either looking at what happened in the absence of planting with the York gum alone or with all of the species together. Um, and so there's 24 plots in there doing that. And that was interesting in the sense of does the land use history influence the kind of responses that we're getting. So there's 124 plots of 110 trees each, apart from the bare ones, um, which is great fun to uh, go out and plant with lots of people. Um, we, what I haven't shown here, that dotted line actually goes to a, a plot layout. Um, going back to your point, Margaret, about the equal density, we also wanted to make sure um, that we didn't have any hidden treatment. So we randomised the position of the individuals across all of the plots for the different particular treatments. That was complicated by the fact that in addition to our plant gradient, we wanted to consider environmental change. Um, and so we actually, as well as doing all of those, we've, we've actually tried to take out the non-native weed species that are in the plots by herbicide, or we've left them in. So this is, you can see what it looks like in September, which is our springtime. Um, and we were also interested in nitrogen deposition. So um, Tim and Beck had great fun getting licenses to being able to put ammonium nitrate down, because of course you can't do that anymore because it's an explosive. Um, and, uh, but I was insistent that we did that because that's actually what atmospheric deposition is. So thankfully the government came around eventually. Um, so <laughs> that's, uh, that's how all of the plots look like. Um, this is what the site looks like um, from the opposite slope. And I've just uh, kind of so just, just to give you an idea of, of, of the so I've circle of trees there that on that map that correspond to those different areas. Um, so that was um, August 2010 it went in, so you know, a good eight, seven or eight months after planting and you couldn't really see any uh, trees there at all. Um, you can maybe see a person, that's a person just there, just to give you an idea of the scale. Um, that's what it looked like a year later, so we'd got, we were really, really fortunate. It was the driest year on record when we put the plants in um, and we just happened to get a ridiculous summer storm that went right over our um, plots um, in the gen so just before the first photo that you saw there um, and that enables us to get about 95 percent survival which was really good uh, a valley down the road got 10 percent survival planting at the same time so very fortunate we replaced individuals in the first year to try and maintain the density um, we're not continuing to do that now because we, we just can't essentially so we um, that's something we're going to have to control for in analyses down the track um, 
I was hoping to be able to show you, you know, what was going on with carbon and things. Uh, right at the moment, Tim and Beck are busy doing carbon analyses in the lab. Um, we're not just interested in above ground, so we've actually tried to get below ground biomass and things. Um, these plants are planted in the surroundings to the experiment, so we're not digging up the experimental plots. We've got additional individuals that we're uh, trying to dig up through time to estimate the carbon and also um, uh, you know, in the roots as well as the shoots. Um, and so that's uh, courtesy of the local grave digger. Which was the, um, I can show you some early results. So this is from the first year of survival. Um, I kind of tried to keep the colours of the plants the same as the graph, essentially. So the yellow is your acacia, your reds are your metaceous shrubs, and your whites are your proteaceous shrubs. Um, and this is just to uh, indicate what happened. If, uh, if they died by chance alone, i.e. following the design of the experiment, that's the pattern you'd expect to see on any graph. Um, and this is actually what we should saw. Um, and what you can essentially see is that the proteaceous species really died in the first year. Um, they were not happy um, in comparison to the other species. The one with the roots, that yeah, here. yeah. Um, and one of the things that we did wonder about at this point was um, some of the uh, species in the genus are very susceptible to high phosphorus because they can't downregulate phosphorus uptake, and so they end up getting uh, toxicity symptoms and dying. Um, but the person who does that is Hans Lambers, and he's our head of school, and he assures us that they're not phosphorus to they, these aren't prone to phosphorus toxicity, the two particular species we've planted here, so it was probably some other reason. And we didn't see any signs of phosphorus toxicity either on the ones that died. And, um, so that's kind of what happened with survival. Uh, just thinking about... Um, growth as well, and then going on to trade-offs, I'll, I'll just um, mention what went on next. Um, this is growth from um, this year, so August, and this is kind of summed across um, the uh, quarter plot, so it's um, taking into account the nitrogen deposition and the herbicide, that didn't have any effect on growth at the moment. Um, and you can see that the uh, most growth is associated with the you know, the York gums only, or the ones with the acacias, um, and it goes down, and this isn't corrected for survival, so it goes down where the proteaceous species are. Uh, clearly, height isn't the only influence, which is why I was really hoping to show you the carbon, but I just don't have that data at the moment, so, um, or the biomass. In terms of trade-offs, though, what's interesting is that the first species to actually flower, which may influence invertebrate assemblages and things um, were actually the proteaceous species. So those are the, that's the Banksia and that's the Hakea that we've got in the site. Um, and so these are, you know, we'll say these are very early preliminary kind of results, but that's what we want to look at through, through time. Um, so we've got pitfall traps in all of the plots and things like that that will indicate the assemblages and things. Um, just in terms of that the kind of novel components to the assemblage appear to be having. In fact, this is just uh, soil moisture. And again, this is just one point in time at the moment. Um, but where the weeds have been controlled, the soil moisture's gone up quite significantly. Um, the interaction comes about because of how much it goes up in the bare compared to the planted treatments, essentially. Um, that, again, just kind of indicates... What's the control so versus it's, herbicide? Yeah, it's kind of weird because control you think of as being... So that's with the weeds in the plot still. Yeah, um, so that's uh, that. Um, so that was kind of just to summarise what um, we've done uh, out there. So that's, I think that you need to, we need to think about um, novel ecosystems as a necessary consideration in restoration um, for those three main reasons, essentially. Um, and so I think we need to consider how we can best do restoration given those um, uh, constraints. Uh, I've illustrated hopefully how you can potentially um, look at um, how we can manage them. So with these conservation opportunities, the um, potential for restoration for function, and so that's where the Ridgefield experiment comes in, uh, and trade-offs among them. And then finally, um, we hope that Ridgefield will be a valuable long-term experiment um, into the recovery of these functions um, and the trade-offs in an agricultural landscape. Um, so uh, yeah, that's it's kind of watch this space with Ridgefield. As I say, it's very early days. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens as the communities develop. In terms of what I was hoping to do here, um, going back to the kind of novelty, and as Margaret pointed out as I was actually going through this um, slide, um, 
we were looking at novelty here, not necessarily novel ecosystem extents. Um, and so I'm trying to think about whether there are ways of uh, improving this estimate, and if we and if we want to improve this estimate, is there a, a reason to do it? Um, and um, I'm wondering whether, from a management and policy perspective, if we know what changes are driving the formation of the novel ecosystems, will that actually help in our management of them as well? Um, so that's what I'd kind of like to think about while I'm here. Um, and so I initially, when I wrote to Margaret about coming, it was trying to think about looking at the help and approach of looking at different ecological drivers of change across different ecosystem types. Can you actually do that kind of approach on land and in the freshwater? Do we have that data available or not? Um, I'm hoping some people here might be able to tell me whether or not that's the, the case. Um, and so thinking about environmental drivers, but also thinking about socioeconomic drivers. So one of the things with the Anthrones approach um, that um, Alessa and Chapin did a review in Tree of, of that approach, and they just said, is population density the most powerful variable explaining variation in socio-ecological properties? Um, now, I did geography a long time ago, but I haven't done socio-ecological stuff for it ever, really. So I'm hoping that um, people here might be able to help me with those, what kind of um, variables might be useful for explaining um, the presence or otherwise of novelty and or novel ecosystems. Um, as well as you know, the importance of the landscape context and the ecosystem types around the area in terms of uh, determining extent. Um, the other um, aspect to this and, um, is, and talking with Earl is um, he's got this uh, GLOBE database, which I'm sure um, he'll talk about if he, when he comes down here. Um, and that's got um, lots of different um, variables at um, the global scale. Um, and those are some of them there. Um, some of those already went into our analysis of um, novelty. So, you know, we considered the suitability of the land and things as the population extended. Um, one thing that we could use GLOBE for, though, and that it's, it's being used for, um, in my presentation today, I've obviously spoken about a number of different kind of case studies of novel ecosystems and how they could be managed. Um, it might be, or it would be good, potentially, to look at commonalities across those kind of case studies. And that's what GLOBE enables you to do. And Earl's got this uh, phrase, meta-study, basically. So trying to compile a database in the same way that the Resilience Alliance have compiled databases on resilience experiments and things. And Earl's doing that at the moment with the land use change uh, community. So thinking about you know, what, what are the drivers of novel ecosystems? Are we missing areas on the GLOBE that we haven't got the research yet? Uh, and oh, that's, I've said that. <laughs> so um, that's basically it. Uh, so thank you very much for listening. Um, I said I was going to plug the book right at the very end. Uh, this is the um, forward to the very first chapter, which I thought would just let people think about. <laughs>